After an extremely strong season 2, Angel was unsurprisingly renewed for a third season by the WB. The shock at the time, however, was that Buffy wasn't renewed as the network couldn't afford to run the show anymore and UPN picked it up for a further two seasons. At this time, the WB and UPN were very hostile towards each other and forbade the two shows to cross over for this season, meaning characters from either show could no longer appear on the other. This meant that Angel, for the first season in its existence, had to rely entirely on the strength of its own characters to tell its story. They did this to an extent last season, but there's no arm back fans on the show now, it's sink or swim, and I'm keen to find out how the show would follow up the critically acclaimed second season. A couple of other things to note before we jump in is the jump to widescreen, which Angel remains for the rest of its run while Buffy stuck to 4x3, even when it changed networks bar the musical episode. There's more frame now, you know we get to have more extreme close ups than before, with characters distanced realistically in one frame rather than being bunched together to fit in the small square in the middle. It's also the final season to have creator David Greenwald as the showrunner, he remained as a consulting producer for the final two seasons but never wrote another episode or contributed to the story following this. This is his swan song for Angel and I'm excited to see what he has in store. This is an episodic analysis of Season 3 of Angel. We open at the hotel, three months following the conclusion of the previous season, where Wesley, Gunn and Cordelia are returning from a demon fight victorious. They're concerned for Fred, who's hardly left her room since they brought her back from Pylea, and unbeknownst to the team, she's going a bit mad and drawn all over the walls. Angel, meanwhile, has been in Sri Lanka since Buffy's death, working through his grief for her by meditating with some monks, who are actually demons, and after killing them all, Angel deems himself successfully free of grief. He returns home with gifts, and is welcomed with open arms by the team. He checks in with the very insane Fred, who is searching in her mind for an answer to why she was brought back. As Angel attempts to convince Fred to leave her room, Cordy has a vision which leads the team to a group of vampires which they deal with pretty easily, but as Angel stakes a female vampire, she recognises him. I'm jealous? <laughs> Flashback to 1767, long before Angelus and Darla were joined by Spike and Drew, they were paired with James and Elizabeth, a prototype version of Spike and Drew, who are two vampires hopelessly in love. They're being hunted by Daniel Holtz, a vampire hunter who has dedicated his entire life to killing Angelus and Darla after they killed his wife and daughter. They narrowly escape his attack due to James being a bit of an annoying asshole. In the present, a grieving James vows to avenge Elizabeth by killing Angel. He visits a demon doctor who performs a procedure on James that allows him to become invincible temporarily by removing his heart. Although Although afterwards he will die in a few hours time. He can't live without Elizabeth so he's going out in a blaze of glory and also so he can kill Angel without Angel killing him first. James locates Angel at the hotel and begins a brawl just as Fred decides to venture out of her room. I came out of my room. Small steps, like he said. Go back to your room and stay there. <clears throat> okay then. Angel and Cornelia are the only other two there as Wes and Gunn are busy getting info from Merrill about where James has been and the doctor he visited. Angel and Cordy flee to the sewers, eventually being chased into a subway train, where Angel and James have it out. James accuses Angel of not understanding what love really is and what it's like to lose your true love, but Angel knows all too well, James, you stupid bastard. Buffy just died. Oh, I guess he doesn't know that, does he? Well, and now he never will, as his time runs out to take out Angel and James crumbles into dust. Back at the hotel, Angel takes James' words seriously about not understanding true love and being able to exist without them. Cordelia tells him that he can honour Buffy's legacy and his memories of her by carrying on. In the final scene, we smash cut to Nicaragua, where Darla sits at a bar looking for the whereabouts of a shaman. After killing a patron, she turns to leave, revealing herself to be incredibly pregnant. Now, most of this is Ezer stuff, which Angel tends to do with its first episode, showing off its villains for one scene to tease the viewer of what's to come. Both Darla and Holtz get this treatment, while there will be plenty more to explore with Holtz later. Darla is pregnant. Turns out there were repercussions for sleeping with her last season, high huh, Angel? Vampires can't get pregnant, so how did this happen? What is she trying to do? What is she going to do? We don't know yet, obviously. Meanwhile, the team is playing forward without Angel until his return. Cordelia really is the heart of the team, but is still suffering from the mental stress of the visions, which was established in the later half of last season. She reminds Angel why it's worth going on after Buffy's death. Side note, I don't know if there was a limited amount of times they could see Buffy's name due to the network split because they try to skip around it often. Buff don't! Say the B word. Wes and Gunn are Wes and Gunn. They haven't changed much since we last saw them. Fred is kind of the same, still a bit mad from her Pylea years. There's a reason why she can't let it all go just yet, which is the entire focus of this first stretch of episodes. James is a fine monster of the week. There's not much to him apart from drawing parallels to Angel with his relationship with Buffy and James' relationship with Elizabeth. Similar to Penn from season one, this is a character who seems to have been really important to Angelus for a long time, who we only see here once and never again in any flashbacks. We don't know why they parted ways, how they parted ways, or why they're in Los Angeles, so there was a lot more to go over here before he dusted himself. I suppose it doesn't matter in the end, but I just find it a bit annoying that the show has done this twice now with a promising villain. The whole vengeance deal with James is very similar to what's going on with Holtz and avenging his family after Angelus killed them. Anyway, time to forget about Holtz for about six whole episodes before he comes up again. 
Yeah, the first six episodes of this season are actually about concluding most arcs that were set up in the previous season, with not much main plot starting until episode 7. We have a new writer though, and that's one Jeffrey Bell. He also acted as an executive producer for the final three seasons of the show. And as a first episode, it's fine. The episode surrounds Cordelia and her visions now having a physical effect on her, leaving behind marks of whatever she sees. She sends a team to collect a magic coin from an elderly couple who are surprisingly energetic for their age. At Wolfram and Hart, Lila meets a new lawyer on the Special Projects branch, Gavin Park, who we last saw at the beginning of the Pilea arc as a teaser for his bigger role here. He has very different ways of fighting Angel, choosing a more societal approach, if you would, coming at him with code violations and property deeds to try and evict him from the hotel. Lila knows this shit isn't going to work at all, and proceeds to use Cal Penn's bulging brain to continue giving Cordelia fake visions to help them free a trapped convict named Billy from a hill dimension. We've actually seen Cal Penn before in the Buffyverse, playing one of the cavemen jocks in the infamous Buffy season 4 episode, Beer Bad. After Cordelia can't hide her afflictions any longer, they get Lauren to deduce whether the visions are actually coming from the powers or not. They're not, and it doesn't take Angel long to catch on that Lila has something to do with it. Lila points him towards Billy and that the coin will help him travel to the dimension he's trapped in. Despite the fact that saving this Billy is a bad idea since he probably deserves to be there, Angel goes ahead with the jailbreak to save Cordelia. He meets Skip, the chillest demon you'll ever meet who actually is on Angel's side, however doesn't agree that Billy should be set free. So, uh, you live in here, Skip? No, I commute. It's not too bad, about 20 minutes. Angel beats Skip and frees Billy, handing him over to Lila, who he proceeds to threaten for coming at him through Cordelia, and that if she ever does it again, he'll kill her. Angel and Cordelia are ultimately concerned at this Billy figure that Angel has freed, but decides to cross that bridge when they come to it. Meanwhile, in Honduras, Darla visits the shaman she was trying to visit last season, who tells Darla that he has no answers as to how she's pregnant, so Darla decides to visit Angel and inform him about his upcoming child. Angel is forced to work for Wolfram and Hart to help Cordelia, getting the unknown Billy out of imprisonment. Clearly this is a task that Lila, nor anyone at Wolfram and Hart, could complete, so they blackmail Angel into doing it. Cordelia doesn't want the visions anymore, and the physical afflictions don't help make a case for them continuing to be a good thing. One thing I don't understand is why she initially tries to hide the visions effect from the team. Is she scared Angel will stop working with her for her safety? Because in the end that doesn't happen. This episode is in fact both Angel and Cordelia's hundredth canonical appearance in the Buffyverse. A skip makes his first appearance also, who will return later in the season with more interesting information. He acts solely as a guard for this episode though, and not much is known about Billy, who acts as a sort of mini-villain for a couple non-consecutive episodes. Gavin Park attempts to make an impression on Angel, but ultimately falls flat. There's only so much a fumigation can do to a man, and mildly inconveniencing him is about all you can do. Like I said, it's a fine episode with funny moments and sets up Cordelia's tiredness of the burden of carrying the visions, which is one of the main plot lines in the first half of the season. Well, looks like we have a gun-centric episode. He's having nightmares about his sister, Alana, who, see, I originally remembered her name that time, which is affecting his relationship with the team when they have to investigate the sudden deaths of peaceful demons in the area. Gun doesn't see why they should care about what kind of demon it is, and that if they're dead, they're better off. Not only does he forget that he's working with a demon, but it seems he's reverted back to his original character following the painful memories of his nightmare. In other news, the team attempt to get Angel to apologise to Merrill for torturing him for information last season, but nothing comes of it. Angel begins to feel guilt when Merrill is one of the many peaceful demons who's brutally killed by this mysterious force. Gunn pays a visit to his old crew again where he meets Geo, the newest member of the crew, who has a very gung-ho attitude to taking out demons. He's not a fan of Gunn since he works with a vampire and Gunn storms off. Cordelia convinces Fred to come sing at Caritas in order to help her grow out of her shell and the safety of her room. While that's happening, another demon is killed and Gunn figures out that it's his crew hitting them from an arrow he finds at the scene belonging to Geo, which he hides from the rest of the team. At Caritas, Fred's singing is interrupted by Geo and the rest of the crew who plan to kill all the demons in the bar. Since Caritas is a sanctuary for demons, they can't cause any harm to other living beings. However, humans are very much allowed to do whatever they want. A bit of a fuck up there, Lauren, but I guess Caritas was never meant for humans after all. Geo wants to kill Angel, so Cordelia is allowed free to fetch him, which she does, and he tells her to visit the Transuding Furies, a trio of mystical women who put the magic spell on Caritas, preventing demons doing any harm. While bored at Caritas, Geo sings karaoke to pass the time, which allows Lauren to read him and use some psychological tricks on the guy to unnerve him. Once Angel arrives, Geo can't convince Gunn to kill him and then offers that whoever kills Angel will be set free. Free. Fred picks up his crossbow but then turns it on Geo. She's stopped as the demon spell is taken down by the Furies and havoc ensues. Geo is killed by a demon and the rest all escape. Wesley has a brief chat with Gunn about how he understands that he might have felt divided loyalties towards both the team and his old crew, but that their relationship has been affected by his betrayal and burying of evidence, and that if it ever happens again, Gunn will be fired. Angel and Gunn talk about how since Gunn didn't kill Angel when pressure to, he showed his trust is true, but Angel tells him his trust will be proven once he can kill him if he has to. So a lot happens 
happens in this episode without it being particularly thrilling. Meryl dies, who was one of the team's contacts in the demon world throughout the past season. He was a fine character, but not much to him besides being a contact, which according to Wesley the team have plenty of now. His death ultimately means nothing. The Transuring Furies are introduced who will only make one more appearance after this. They're a bit convenient for the plot's sake, having a previous relationship with Angel, but I suppose it is never established how Lauren put his magic spell on Caratus, so it works, I say begrudgingly. Geo is our villain for the episode, showing a vendetta similar to Riley from Buffy, where all demons are evil and even if they are considered peaceful, they shouldn't be allowed to live among us. I like the scene where Lauren stands up to Geo after reading his aura. It's a clear change in character since we first met him, who once hated confrontation and avoided it at all costs. While its guns trusted is ultimately tested in this episode, Fred proves her loyalty to Angel by trying to kill Geo. She's someone who isn't used to killing things and seemingly doesn't hesitate to stand up for her hero. She also has a crush on Angel too, since he's the one who valiantly rescued her from Pylea, and this will all be expanded upon in the next episode. Meanwhile, both Wesley and Gunn are growing feelings towards Fred too, which was hinted at in the first episode but not really mentioned until now. This episode is the only instance of the network messing with the airing of either Buffy or show. Almost the entire run, episodes were aired in their production order, which is how most shows are intended to be consumed. But this episode was actually supposed to be the second episode, with that vision thing being episode 3. I guess they were flipped since this episode isn't the most exhilarating for a second episode, you know, intended to keep the viewer interested after the exciting setups and situations of the premiere. That being said, my DVD copy still lists them in their original production order, so I ended up watching these in the production order, this one first and then that vision thing as the third episode. They can be watched either way, because they don't really talk about the other episodes much, however, as someone who is a big fan of both Firefly and Homicide Life on the Street, I am extremely well versed in networks messing about with narratives by airing episodes out of order for the sake of having more action early on. Rest assured, if I ever look at those two shows, it will be in production order. Anyway, passable episode. The supposed fallout between Wesley and Gunn is completely forgotten about after this, but it once again helps Gunn move on from his old days, which I swear he already did, but never mind. Scott Murphy worked on only this season of Angel writing two episodes. He reminds me a lot of Dan Weber, who was a writer on the third season of Buffy, who also only wrote two episodes, both of which were very funny and done in a humorous way. Scott Murphy does the same with his episodes. This first one, our plot surrounds Angel swapping bodies with an old man named Marcus, who wishes to live forever young. He's been taking over other people's bodies recently, leaving behind their skins when the bodies can't take any more, which is how the gang are turned onto his trail. Most of the episode is spent with Angel trying to escape the retirement home while having heart attacks and other old people blocking his path, and Marcus, a complete lady, man flirting with Cordelia, Fred, and even Lila. Fred's crush on Angel intensifies and Cordelia wants Angel to tell her that an office romance is a bad idea and that nothing will come of it. However, Marcus has a different idea and instead messes with Fred as she comes down to ready for a date, right as he's making out with Lila. Lila stops by because she wants to prevent Gavin's ideas from working to take down Angel, instead wishing to do it herself. She hands him some forms that legitimise his business before storming out after Marcus bites her, unaware he's possessed a vampire. After researching and discovering he's gonna live forever in this body and that it will never burn out since he's a vampire, he plans to kill Angel in Marcus's body so that there's no way the two can swap back. Cordelia finds Fred and it doesn't take them long to deduce that Angel is definitely not Angel and that he hasn't been the same since he visited the retirement home. They stop Marcus, swap the two back, and Angel finally has that talk with Fred about office romances being a bad idea. Cordelia suddenly bursts through the doors to tell Angel that Buffy is alive, ending the episode. This is, without a doubt, the funniest episode of the show so far. I have never laughed harder and more frequently at an episode of Angel. Romance with Fred. So I'm a... Obviously. I really like Murphy's writing. It reminds me a lot of Jane Esmondson. For example, the Angel Lila thing is played entirely for laughs, and I wouldn't have it any other way. Seriously, this, this is weird, but because the show acknowledges how absurd an idea is that these two would ever be romantically involved, it works. The purpose of the episode is to rid Fred of her crush on Angel, which is successfully done by the end, as Angel's attention is quickly taken up by Buffy's return. He'll now leave to have a meet-up with her, which I'll talk more about in the next episode. And while it's mostly another daft one-off plot with a vague essence of overarching with Fred's crush on Angel being dissolved, it's still one of my favourite episodes of the show. Here's a funny thing, I remember once reading on the Angel subreddit, you should check it out, it's surprisingly very active for a show centred around a spin-off that ended nearly 20 years ago, and there was a user that was only a fan of the first two seasons of Angel, believing everything from season 3 onward to be too similar to Buffy for them to enjoy. Yeah, I'm still confused by that statement even to this day, and have remembered it because of how absurd it is. I only bring this up because the premise for this episode could easily fit into season 2, which was the first season to bring in more comedic storylines, not season 3. Also, remember in season 1, the episode where Cordelia gets pregnant? Wasn't that fucking ridiculous? And also completely forgetting how dark some of the subject matters in season 4 get, I couldn't see an episode where Xander swaps bodies with an old man, I just don't think the writers could make it work. The two shows are completely unique, don't let influence take effect. This episode is well worth your time. 
Muir Smith writes the first Fred-centric episode of the show, and while most episodes of this season so far have had subplots surrounding Fred, she takes the spotlight here. Her parents are able to locate her thanks to a letter she sent them when she arrived back from Pylea, telling them she's okay, but not to look for her. They hire the PI to find where she was, but Fred is freaked out when she sees them, causing her to flee the hotel, something the team have struggled to make her do thus far. Yet she's seriously terrified of her parents, however normal they may seem. As the team searches for her, with Angel looking in the sewer, unknowingly being hunted by a giant bug demon, Fred heads to the still wrecked from two episodes ago Caritas and asks Lauren for guidance. He warns her that she hasn't run far enough from her own demons, and she asks him for money to leave the city. The team turns to Lauren after being unsuccessful everywhere else in finding Fred, and Angel manages to convince the pissed off demon to give up where she is. The bus station, as Fred is reunited with her parents, revealing that they aren't actually evil in any way, but that Fred has thought that her being rescued from Pylea was all a dream or mirage, and that if her parents were truly here, it meant that she wasn't always in Pylea, and that she did have a life before on Earth. Suddenly the bug demon attacks, and unbelievably, Fred's mum's the one to take it out, driving over it with a bus. Back at the hotel, Fred prepares to leave the team, returning to Texas with her parents, but on the taxi ride to the airport, she realises something about the blood-covered shirt she kept as a memento. They're now crystals, and Fred demands they return to the hotel. Earlier in the episode, Angel fought a random demon in the sewers, taking its head as a trophy, which has the exact same crystals on it. The bug demons surround the hotel, with the team very much outnumbered, until Fred uses one of her little gadgets she's built to cut the severed head open, revealing the crystals were actually signifying where the demon had laid its eggs. They're actually a peaceful race, and we're only looking for their babies. After having proven to herself that she's worth staying with the team, she bids farewell to her parents, who do stick around for a few days to help Fred clean up her room and make sure she's okay. At the end of the episode, Fred covers over a drawing she made of her an angel, moving on from Pylea for good. And that's the point of the episode, to stop Fred being insane and make her a comprehensible character. Through her deduction at the end of the episode and her creative gadget that the team theorised about its use throughout the duration of the episode, We think it's some sort of mechanised weapon. Possibly influenced by the medieval catapult, designed for serious to fatal wounding, if not outright decapitation. Or it makes toast. Or it makes toast. She shows herself to be the willow of the team, if I had to compare it to another character. She is incredibly smart, she was a physics student after all. She remained insane after being rescued because she still believed to be in Pylea, and couldn't comprehend any scientific reason why she was brought back to Earth, a world she had only faint memories of by the end of the five year stint in Pylea. She turns to Lauren for guidance, and the two will now build a strong friendship together due to their connection with Pylea. Fred's parents make their first appearance here, and while their mother is a pleasant character, Mr. Burkle is top tier. His comedic timing is unbelievable. And he's one of my favourite side characters that the show ever had. I wish you hadn't brought that thing out again. It gives me the willies. Don't be silly, Trish. It's just a severed head. It probably helps he's played by veteran actor Gary Grubbs, who is a name you might not recognise, but name any TV show, and there's a fucking 50% chance this guy was in it at one point or another. Angel turns from his meeting with Buffy, which was spoken about in both shows, but never actually shown on screen due to the network change. Characters from either show could no longer appear on the other, as the WB and UPN were very hostile towards each other at the time. We don't know much about what happens between the two, but all we know is, it doesn't go well. Leave it up to your own imagination, but this meeting is treated as completely unimportant and both shows completely forget about it following this, so whatever. They're still interconnected, but they're just going through a rough patch. The scene at the end where both Wesley and Gunn cuddle Fred goodbye is an excellent use of both subtext and foreshadowing to how they will both handle their affection for Fred during the season. Gunn grabs Fred with no hesitation and hugs her firmly with no shame. Wesley is very timid and awkwardly embraces her, unsure for how long to hug her or what to say. I love little things like this because this will ultimately describe why Fred picks who she picks later on. Wesley also mentions his strained relationship with his parents, which has been teased for nearly two seasons now. This is going to become a main reasoning for Wesley's decision making throughout the later portion of the season. I like the episode. A bit of a mess structurally and the way it's filmed. For example, the big bug creatures had to be shot in a more choppy frame rate, as they were actually huge puppets that were a nightmare to control, resulting in them having to do it frame by frame, digitally removing any puppeteers or sticks, as opposed to just filming it. Season 3 has been a bit of a slow burner so far. It's not given us our villains or main plots just yet. Instead, choosing to wrap up any loose ends from season 2 first, providing brief mini-plots between characters to bide our time. And next we have another example of this. I say this all like it's a bad thing, but Angel was always intended to be an anthological show, and I think a part of that was brought back for this season. Billy is an incredibly strong episode of the show, also being the 50th episode to boot. An uncredited Joss Whedon had a lot to do with this episode too, including writing and rewriting a few scenes. Billy, who was rescued from his hell prison in that vision thing, returns to Wolfman Heart. He's the nephew of a very important congressman, and also a half-demon. He's able to turn men into misogynistic killers with just a simple touch, which explains why he was imprisoned. By the way, an extremely unique plot! He uses this on 
on Gavin, who ends up attacking Lila. At Wesley's place, the team have all met up for dinner, and Wesley reveals to Cordelia that he's attracted to Fred and wants to initiate a romance between the two, unsure if it's the right thing to do since they work together. Cordelia makes the point that since they aren't going to find anyone else in this line of work to get involved with, it makes sense if he wishes to start something within the team. A complete 180 to what was established two seasons ago with Cordelia and Doyle. That ended with Doyle's sudden death, which broke Cordelia's heart since she genuinely cared for him. Cordelia does make a good point here, and I can get behind it, so I guess they're showing her character growth since Doyle's death. It could just be an excuse to introduce a ridiculous amount of romantic storylines all at once this season, but we'll talk about that later on. This is followed by a cordy vision of a murder that happened a week earlier at a convenience store where a husband killed his wife, which the team investigate, to find that Billy was in the store moments before the murder. Angel confronts a black and blue Lila about this, and she tells him that taking down Billy is next to impossible due to the powers he has, both the demonic and the fact that he's in one of the most rich political families in the country. Angel doesn't listen and travels to Billy's family estate, where he finds Billy, who has called the police on himself, believe it or not. He touches one of the police officers, causing him to act out at his fellow female officer as they're taking Billy into custody. The car crashes and Billy escapes. Angel and Wesley find some of his blood on the nearby wall next to the crash site, and Wesley takes a sample to examine to understand a bit more about how his demon powers work. Cordelia goes out to help find Billy on her own, getting some information from Lila that leads her to Billy's cousin. Angel follows Billy sent to the same cousin a little while after Cordelia, and he tells Angel that Billy has taken a private plane to flee to Santa Monica. Back at the hotel, Wesley and Fred do some research on Billy's blood. Lie to me again. And we're going to have a problem. Oh shit, so yeah, the component that turns men into sexist killers is in Billy's blood, and Fred has to run around the hotel, similar to The Shining, to escape a mad Wesley. She runs into Gunn, who helps her hide, but after finding out that it's Billy's blood that turns men evil, he reveals that he picked up the sample to look at it and that he'll soon change. He begins to do so as he begs Fred to knock him out. She does and soon does the same to Wesley, outsmarting them both. At the airport, Cordelia plans to kill Billy, but Angel stops her just in time, not wanting any death on her conscience. Billy touches Angel, but it doesn't affect Angel since he hasn't been a man for a long time. The two tussle as Billy is shot by Lila, of all people. Later, as Cordelia and Angel theorise why Billy's powers didn't affect him, chalking it up to Angelus getting pleasure from killing rather than doing it through hatred for humans, Wesley isolates himself in his apartment as Fred pays him a visit. He's terrified of the kind of man he could be, and needs some time to reevaluate who he really is, shocked by what he was capable of when Billy's powers took hold. Fred encourages him to return to work, but after she leaves, she hears him crying through the door. The final act of this episode is great, and I've always loved this episode for what it sets up. Sure, this episode closes out our easier episodes, as after this, our season officially starts. However, Wesley's crush on Fred is ultimately the beginning of his downward spiral. Due to Billy's blood taking over him, he believes this to have ruined any chance of him winning Fred over for the time being. He thought he knew what kind of man he was, and finding out that within himself there was this primordial misogynistic killer, it fucks with the poor guy. In fact, Wesley not knowing what kind of man he is is a recurring theme throughout the season as we'll see later. Cordelia wishes to be more active in the demon slaying aspect of the job instead of just being the vision girl. Her and Angel practice some sword play and hand-to-hand -hand combat through the episode. Cordelia's going a lot as a character, like I mentioned earlier, and she seems to open to starting another romance within the team if the chemistry arises. Billy acts as a nice mini-villain for this early portion of the season with a unique villain premise for the show. I'd call him a monster of the week, but he does technically make two appearances, so he counts as recurring. Again, the whole episode is great, but that last 20 minutes had me on the edge of my seat during both my first watch and even my watch for this video. Check this one out again if you wrote it off before. So with the six episode prologue out of the way, we finally get underway with showrunner David Greenwalk kicking us off. The team are trying to locate an ancient scroll containing a potential prophecy about an upcoming apocalypse. Gunn and Wes bring into a collector's house to obtain it. Back at the hotel, Fred walks in on one of Angel and Cordelia's training sessions and has a chat with Angel about all the flowers Cordelia has been giving him recently. She believes that Angel and Cordelia are attracted to each other, but both too ashamed to admit it. I mean, we know that Angel thinks Cordelia is attracted from last season's bikini incident, but Cordelia has always found Angel attractive ever since they first met back in the first season of Buffy. Angel tries to initiate something between the the two, but all of that is stopped when Darla finally arrives and reveals her pregnant state. If you remember after Angel had his epiphany, he denied that he ever had sex with Darla to Cordelia, so Cordy is very betrayed by this reveal. Completely confused about how a vampire could ever get pregnant, they turn to Lauren, who's rebuilding Caritas yet again. Lauren ultimately has no idea why she's pregnant, and they begin to theorise that maybe Angel and Darla's child is whatever shall bring forward the apocalypse. Cordelia and Darla begin to bond over their connection of having both had demonic pregnancies, and trust me Cordelia, you haven't seen the fucking worst of it yet, love. Anyway, Darla is still evil in case anyone forgot, and she attacks Cordelia, feeding from her, as Cordelia proceeds to have a vision right at that very moment. Angel luckily steps in as Darla flees. Cordelia's vision actually leads Angel right to Darla, who is currently craving young blood due to her pregnancy. Like humans get cravings during pregnancy, so do vampires apparently. Angel manages to stop her from killing a child at a local amusement park, and as the two stop briefly, they both use their demon hearing to hear a faint heartbeat within Darla's belly. Their child has a soul. He takes her back to the hotel for the time being, as Fred completes her calculations on when the prophesied bringer of the apocalypse is about to arrive. 
place, like right now. In an unknown location, a demon named Sajan prepares to resurrect something from a tomb, and as he waits impatiently, the tomb opens, revealing the vampire hunter, Daniel Holtz. A great start to the season, he says at episode 7. But yes, Darla's pregnancy, Daniel Holtz, Sajan, these are the ingredients we've been waiting for to get the season underway. There is a brief flashback scene at the start of the episode where Angelus gets kidnapped by Holtz in 1771 before being rescued by Darla. The two decide that tormenting Holtz is more fun than just putting the guy out of his misery, which Angel will soon learn to regret in the coming episodes. Holtz is awoken in the 21st century somehow, and Sajan lets him know that Angel is very much still alive and that now is the time to get his vengeance. Sajan is played by Jack Conley, who we last saw in the Buffyverse when he played the werewolf hunter Kane from season 2 of Buffy. That was a character I wish we got more of than just one episode, so at least they gave him a recurring role on this show. There's more of this prophecy stuff that Fred and Wesley are working on throughout the episode, awkwardly pressing on following last episode's ordeal, which Wesley references at one point. He also makes this incredibly glaring bit of foreshadowing to people on repeat viewings. Maybe your child is a pivotal figure. Maybe your destiny is simply to help bring it to the world. Or to stop it. We'll learn more about it later on. Darla's baby has a heartbeat, meaning that it is in some form alive and not a vampire. This will obviously have an effect on Darla since she technically has a soul within her for the duration of the pregnancy. These effects will be seen shortly. Angel and Cordelia come excruciatingly close to starting a romance here thanks to Fred pushing Angel to say something. It's just a tease though as the two are put on hold for a portion of the episode due to Angel's lie about sleeping with Darla. A lot of people aren't fans of the Angel Cordelia stuff the show does here, but I think it's only natural that the two would grow close since they've been working together for the entire run of the show and have known each other even longer than that. They've been with each other through the best of times and the worst of times. It's a natural progression for them to head into since they both clearly feel attraction towards each other. Let's hope that nothing gets between that natural progression, huh? We start this episode by seeing Angelus and Darla's killing of Holt's family firsthand and their subsequent taunting of the poor guy. In the present, Holtz and Sajan are revealed to have made an agreement 227 years earlier in which Sajan brought Holtz into the future to kill Angelus and Darla and if he refused, he would never cross paths with them again and miss his chance. So while Holtz gets up to speed on all the things that have happened up to now within the world, Darla goes into labour and the team take her to a local teaching hospital to use their equipment to have a look at the baby. It's a human and it's a boy. Can I have a son? I'm gonna have a son. Suddenly a vampire cult appears and wishes to protect the baby from any harm. That includes killing all of Angel Investigations and Darla in order to have no further intervention from unwanted parties. Meanwhile at Wolfram and Hart, those exterminators we saw a few episodes ago were actually planting bugs in the hotel, and Lila and Gavin soon discover Darla's pregnancy, sending the newly appointed president of special projects, Linwood Murrow, into a complete meltdown wondering how they missed this. A group of military men is sent to the hotel to help this creepy doctor dude capture Darla so that Wolfram and Hart can dissect both her and the baby. Guess who else is at the hotel? Holtz with a newly recruited group of grappler demons thanks to Sajan. He kills all of the soldiers as the team escape from the hospital in time to plan where they'll flee to. Wesley suggests they head back to the hotel to quickly grab the still half-translated Nyassian scroll, and the team wait outside as Angel heads in to find the dead soldiers and the newly resurrected Holtz. Right at that moment, Darla's water breaks. Holtz has Angel captured, and Lila shows up after she finds out that all the soldiers are dead, and she informs Holtz about Angel's soul. Angel uses this distraction to grab a grenade and blow himself an escape route. Lila manages to grab the scroll before fleeing herself. You get another flashback scene where it's revealed that Angelus and Darla didn't just kill Holt's daughter, they turned her into a vampire. He had to kill his own daughter. That's even more fucked. Back at the car, Holt's demons managed to find the team, with Darla running them over before driving off, leaving them all behind. <laughs> what are we looking at? Angel gets the team up to speed on Holt's return. Holt's meanwhile confronts Sajan for not informing him about Angel's soul, as now he must hunt him differently than before. As Sajan swears he hasn't left any other information out, which isn't true, Holt still doesn't know about Darla being pregnant, Angel locates Darla through her scent, where she reveals that she's beginning to feel the effects of the soul on herself, and that she truly loves the child within her. She makes Angel swear to protect the baby from her, as when she gives birth, she will lose the soul and no doubt try to kill it, forgetting the love she once felt. At Wolfram and Hart, Lila gets a translator to work on the Nyasian scrolls, which foretell that there will be no birth of the baby, only death. Angel takes Darla to Cadithus where a demon that was working on rebuilding the club a few episodes ago that was fired tells Sajan and Holtz where Angel is. As the team theorise over why the powers that be would allow this to come to pass, Darla reveals that she can feel the baby dying. Her body, a vampire body, isn't built to give birth, and then it's unlikely she was successfully birth a live child. Morbid thought, I know. Holtz shows up and finds a loophole in the violence spell that Lawrence put on the place by throwing a barrel of gasoline and a grenade from outside of the club down the stairs, completely destroying Cadithus yet again. 
scene. The team hurries to the exits, but Darla collapses, completely guilt-ridden about what they did to Holtz, and that this child is the one good thing that her and Angelus ever did. With that, Darla stakes herself, and the child is unconventionally born, left behind in the dust. Holtz watches as Angel protects his son, standing between Angel and the rest of the team. The two look in each other's eyes as Holtz lowers his crossbow, allowing Angel to escape. Holtz is badgered by Sajan as he swore he would show Angel no mercy, but Holtz simply responds by saying, I swore that I would show no mercy. And I won't. Out of all the villains in both Buffy and Angel, Holtz is really the only one I can actively sympathise with. He has a very justified reason to kill Angel and Darla, and we see firsthand the hell the two put him through over the miserable life that he had. Despite this, after learning of Angel's soul, he doesn't kill him at the end of the episode. He did mention that he has to hunt Angel differently now that he has a soul, and especially now that he has a child, but his plan that he has may have something in mind that involves Angel's son in the same way Angelus did with Holt's children. However, I do like to think that in that moment, Holt sees a part of himself in Angel being a father and doesn't want to become the same monster that Angel was, tearing a family apart. I'm probably very wrong with that assumption as Holtz is still gunning for him after this. Actually, that scene where Lauren sees Holtz attack coming because Holtz starts humming a tune to himself as he leaves the club. Oh, I love that scene. And they do this again later in the season with a different character and that ends up being one of my favourite scenes of the show. So I'll talk about that one again once we get there. Darla sacrifices herself to bring their son into the world and this marks the end of our character. She is not resurrected again, unfortunately. Although we have plenty more flashbacks to come so we will see her again. This is a good point for her character to end. You know, she had a good run as a villain twice, and a brief run as an ally to Angel, also twice, and they did all they could with her, and it allows the story to progress into the Daddy Angel story arc which takes over for the second chunk of the season. Remember back in season 2 when Angel completed the trials to win a new life for Darla? Well, I mentioned back then that the life he had won was still very valid, and here it is. A son. An impossible son that shouldn't exist, yet it does. All these cults and hunters are desperate to get their hands on him to either worship him or, because selling his parts, ugh, would bring them a great fortune on the demon market. We get to understand why Holtz was brought into the 21st century because the all-knowing Sajan wants Angel dead, so well, we don't know why, but he does and believes Holtz to be the right man for the job. Why doesn't Sajan not just do it himself? We also don't know. Linwood Morrow makes his first appearance. He's our Holland Manor's replacement, looking to make Lila and Gavin compete for his and the company's approval. And I'm just going to say it now, he sucks compared to Holland. There's nothing inherently wrong with Linwood. He functions as a character in the same way Holland did, and that's just my problem. It negates Holland's shocking death in the previous season because we have him here again, just under a different name and face. Gavin has planted some cameras in the hotel though and captures Lila's kiss with Angel when he was possessed by the old man. This will continue to be a plot point as the team are still unaware of the presence of these bugs. It's also the final appearance of Caritas and like a lot of Angel locations, it's ultimately destroyed in its final scene. But this is a great two-parter and it's finally got things moving at a faster pace. How will the team, and Angel for that matter, deal with the new baby? David Goodman is a new name to the show, but he actually worked on Buffy as a script coordinator since its second season, eventually leaving at the end of season 6. He dipped his hand in writing only for Angel though, writing two episodes of the show, both in this season. He's most known for his extensive contributions to Once Upon a Time, another show which he worked with alongside Jane Esmondson, another Buffy writer and producer. The team return to the hotel to find it trashed, and a homeless Lauren announces he's moving in, feeling he's entitled to due to the amount of times his club has been destroyed by the team. Angel is very protective of his son already, but is obviously clueless how to do any parental tasks, so Cordelia lends a hand, which he allows after she proves that Angel will be unable to go into the sunlight where his son will eventually want to play. A demon attempts to take the child, which pushes the team to get the Furies to set up a mystical barrier around the hotel for the time being. Holtz poisons all the demons that Sajan recruited, wanting to start from the basics to take Angel out. Sajan asks why he can't just simply stake Angel, but Holtz knows it's never going to be that easy. He wants to recruit proper soldiers, fueled by their hatred for vampires, to follow him into battle. His first recruit is Justine, a stubborn woman who's fallen off the rails after her sister was killed by a vampire. She sees herself as a vampire hunter, trying to take them out with hardly any experience in fighting or combat. Holtz convinces her to train with him and he'll act as a mentor. At Wolfram and Hart, Lila attempts to learn all she can about Holtz in the Files and Records department, eventually getting the whole story from this creepy robot woman. The hotel is eventually surrounded by demons wanting to take away Angel's son and Angel leads them away through the sewers. Wolfram and Hart watch this on their cameras and send their own men out after him too, as the rest of the team fight off the demons that break through the barrier and into the hotel with a very convenient flamethrower. Angel leads the rest of the cadavers into an abandoned mine shaft before fleeing without the baby, except it's not actually a baby. It's a... 
So this probably needs explaining. Uh, earlier in the episode, Lauren and Angel have a very cryptic conversation that doesn't really make much sense. Turns out as the cameras capture much to Wolfman Hart's annoyance that they didn't see sooner, Lauren could hear the buzzing of the bugs thanks to his demon hearing and tipped Angel off through a note that he slides into his pocket that the broom closet was the only place they hadn't bugged. He left the baby there while he fled, and after the team had taken out the demons at the hotel, they then took the baby to get its usual checkups at the hospital. Angel, meanwhile, threatens Linwood to never come after his son again or allow anyone else to or else he'll do to Linwood whatever harm is done to his son eye for an eye, that sort of idea. Once it's concluded that the baby is healthy, the nurses ask for the baby's name for their records. Connor. His name is Connor. The team then takes the baby Connor out of the hospital and back home to the hotel. For a mid-season finale, it's pretty good. Buffy and Angel tended to do this thing where they would have the first chunk of nine episodes and then wait a month before airing the 10th in mid-December on its own, before taking a mid-season break until mid to late January. So even though we had a two-parter, this is the proper mid-season finale. Connor is officially named and all his pursuers are now taken care of thanks to Angel's bomb as well as his threatening of Linwood. Angel's very attached to Connor and we get a lot of Daddy Angel scenes where he tries to stop him crying and whatnot. Funnily enough, the only thing that stops Connor from crying is Angel's vampire face. Foreshadowing, perhaps. Lauren moves into the hotel here and although he doesn't become main cast until partway through the following season, he really becomes part of the team from this point forward, appearing in almost every episode after this. I like that we don't get the reveal of how Lauren figures out the building's bugged and how he tips off Angel until later, although if you re-watch the episode you do see him slip the note in Angel's pocket with his other hand wiggling around near Connor to misdirect the viewer so they don't catch on too quickly, spoiling the eventual resolution with the teddy bomb. Justine also makes her first appearance here, taking over Kate's role from season 2, and if if you're wondering why I'm saying that when the two characters are very different, well, this was actually supposed to be Kate. Like I mentioned last season, Elizabeth Rome wasn't available anymore and so the writers had to create an entirely different character to be Holt's second in command. I am very happy that they did this. Kate forgave Angel and negating that to have her return to be a shadow villain for a third season in a row would have really grown my gear something fierce. It's Cordelia's birthday, and she fucking dies. Oh, not really, a vision she has allows the powers that be send her to an astral plane so that Skip, her supposed guide, can show her what her true path was supposed to be. We find out that Doyle passing the visions on to Cordelia was unprecedented and was never supposed to happen. No human was ever intended to have the visions or else the back of their head will explode, apparently. The team also discovers that Cordelia has been taking prescription medication for migraines as well as getting MRI scans to show her brain is literally dying like she should be dead. Skip tells Cordelia that she was always meant to be a famous actress instead of meeting Angel and that she can stay in her reality and die or be transported to her true path and live a full life. The second half of the episode takes place in this alternate dimension where Cordelia is the star in a popular sitcom. She can't help her curiosity and ends up following her vision. She meets Gunn and Wesley, who is now one-armed. Oh no wait, there is. They take her to Angel, who's gone insane since Doyle passed the visions onto him. Cordelia kisses Angel and the visions are once again passed to her as she regains her memory of her previous reality. Skip returns and is a bit pissed at Cordelia for not leaving well enough alone and enjoying her life of being rich and famous. She refuses to go back and pleads to find another way for her to return to her old reality. Skip makes her part demon, which allows her not to be affected by the visions, allowing her to live on. She awakens and sure enough she experiences no pain from the visions she gets, instead of floating. Although let's just gloss over the fact that Doyle was half demon and he still got extreme migraines and sure as hell didn't float. I can only theorise that since Doyle was half demon and Cordelia was part demon, maybe the amount of demon affects the pain, maybe there's more demon in Cordelia than there was in Doyle, although Cordelia still seems human in her appearance with no side effects, maybe Cordelia is more than just a demon after all. We'll have to wait and see. It's so weird to see the show talk at length about Doyle again. He's just had passing mentions for the past season and a half and actively seeing videos of him is jarring. I'm actually quite disappointed they couldn't get Quinn back to reprise the character for just this episode. I know he was entering the last of his life at this point and I'm not sure what state he would have been in and if he could have pulled off a good performance successfully, but not even for a brief scene in the alternate reality. He was just dead again and instead kissed Angel. Skips back and is now a guide for the powers that be, although what he was doing at Billy's prison in that case confuses the life out of me. Let me just tell you this now, there's far more to this whole skip business and to be honest, it gets really confusing thanks to season 4. It effectively brings this whole episode into question, but I don't really want to spoil that here. I personally don't think that the writers had planned that far ahead. This here in this episode is the powers that be, and all the information they give here is accurate. But not really, and that's the main drawback of the episode. All of this is to make Cordelia part demon, but the eventual reveal of who Skip is makes me question why any of this alternate reality stuff even happens, and what the point of it is. It works in season 3, but past that, it doesn't work at all. Funny how I'm already having a dig at season 4 and we're not even there yet. 
push to earn more money for the team and help the helpless, which Cordelia reminds Angel they haven't done quite a bit, the team start up a website which brings the clients in by the bucket load. This is the first episode to focus on multiple cases at the same time. Angel visits Harlan Elster, a businessman who wants Angel to take out a nest of vampires that's extorting money from his company in return for $20,000. This isn't actually Harlan Elster, it's Sam who used to work for Harlan until his friend was killed by the group of vampires he sent Angel to kill. It drove Sam off the rails about who's looking for revenge. Angel confronts him when he finds out the truth and together they take out the vampires with Angel eventually having to leave empty handed since Sam doesn't have any real money to offer him. Wes and Gunn help defend a woman from her undead boyfriend who it's revealed she actually killed and after a fight the two get back together. The main case of the episode is with Fred and Lauren as these Nadra demons request Fred's help to put together a puzzle for them for... Fifty thousand dollars?! Fifty thousand dollars?! We accept. Lauren leaves for the bathroom, coming across the Nadra's demon's real plan of cutting off Fred's head to replace their prince's old one, which is quickly dying. Cordelia gets a vision of this and heads to help the two herself, since she can't reach Gunn and Wes, who are busy with the zombie ex-boyfriend I mentioned earlier. They do eventually show up, though, along with Angel, and save Fred and Lauren, taking the money, believing they deserve it after the day they've all had. The only other plotline in this episode involves Holtz punishing Justine for disobeying an order of his. Oh! Oh, Holtz is kinda crazy, huh? Well, it ends with Justine being sent out to recruit more people like her for Holtz's crew, also fueled by their hatred for vampires. And this is an extremely well-crafted easer episode by Scott Murphy. It's just as funny, and all three cases are pretty memorable. There's the zombie ex-boyfriend, the teeth-chattering demons, and Jeffrey Dean Morgan, and let's be honest, with those three things with the setup for its own show, you'd watch the hell out of it. I always got the feeling from this episode that the friend Sam goes on about was actually his boyfriend, considering how much he talks about things they bought for each other and what they meant. Maybe they were just really close, but the WB man, let me tell you, they went very keen on Willow and Tara, so I wouldn't be surprised if they put their foot down on this one. And who doesn't love the Nadra demons? I know they're evil and all, but they're such a unique idea for a demon. It's the zombie ex-boyfriend that's the weakest part of the episode, although there is still something worthwhile there. Both Wes and Gunn are still crushing hard on Fred, which will all come to a head in the next episode, so it brings something to the table. Holtz is building his crew with Justine's help, and it won't be long before he starts to spring his plans into action. Thinking back on it now, this is a great episode of the show, and one I always point to as being the strongest depiction of what makes Angel, Angel. Great cases, great chemistry, and great writing. Thanks for these two great episodes, Scott Murphy. Joss Whedon had very little involvement with both this season of Angel and the corresponding sixth season of Buffy, aside from writing one episode for each. He was off developing Firefly at the time, which would then quickly see his return to Buffy for the second half of its final season. As his only contribution to the season, this episode has his writing all over it. I mean, the symbolism and storytelling is much more advanced than previous episodes. You can just tell this was him. The team go out to the ballet, where Angel makes the chilling conclusion that he saw the exact same ballet troupe over a hundred years earlier with the same dancers and choreography. Angel and Cordelia go backstage with their attempt temporarily possessed by the spirits of some of the ballet troupe, revealing a secret affair one of the dancers had behind the back of the organiser, Count Kurskov, who uses his power centre to keep her trapped to forever perform the same ballet over and over for all eternity. The spirits are crying for help, similar to I Only Have Eyes For You, one of my favourite episodes of Buffy if you remember. Angel and Cordelia get uncomfortably close as a result, while both Wesley and Gunn attempt to make their move on Fred. Unbeknownst to Wes, however, Fred is falling for Gunn. They all go backstage searching for the missing Cordelia and Angel, where Gunn is stabbed by one of Kurskov's minions, these creepy theatre mask demons that multiple apply when killed. Even though it's just a flesh wound, Fred finds herself scared for gun safety and the two share a passionate kiss. Wesley finds them and quietly walks away to get possessed. Once they all meet up again, Wesley figures out the whole story through his possession and Angel heads to convince the ballet dancer in question, who had the secret affair to change her dance, due to Kurskov's effects on her fading thanks to the team's meddling. She does so and is set free from her curse as Angel smashes Kurskov's power centre, returning them and Kurskov himself into death. Returning to the hotel, Angel begins to confess his romantic feelings for Cordelia until... Girl? Yes, we, we, we grew closer together, and I, I think that- Grew! Princess! Oh. <gasps> grew is back. He's been booted into this reality after Pylea formed a republic with no need for a leader similar to the one Cordelia made him at the conclusion of the Pylea arc. The characters are drawn together throughout the episode. Angel and Cordelia's chances of getting together are thrown out the window when Gru shows up and Angel is upset at this. He found himself actually falling in love with Cordelia, pushed to say something by both Fred and Lorne. A love triangle. On top of another love triangle, as Fred and Gunn begin a relationship here, leaving Wesley alone. Both Angel and Wesley are in very similar situations by the end, with two parallel storylines at the same time. I can't think of another time that either of the two shows have done that. Uh, there's symbolism in what's going on with the ballet troupe and the team, with secret feelings for each other being hidden for the sake of protecting emotions from potentially being shattered, and that's Summer Glow playing the ballet dancer, and it's funny I mentioned Firefly earlier, as she would go on to play River in the show, as Whedon was turned on to her through her casting in this episode. It's a very character-driven episode, a lot of the scenes of the team have them all together. You'll be with Uncle Lorne. 
who in no way resents not being asked to go to the ballet. And it's great fun watching Gun be disappointed that I'm going to the ballet. Gun, these guys are tight, and you're going to be tripping out. Don't be using my own phrases when we've lost the trust. And then he ends up loving it. His relationship with Fred is one of the best in the show, and as much as I personally prefer Wesley and Fred together, I mean, those two are basically written to be for each other, but they are brought together for the purpose of keeping the viewer intrigued. You genuinely feel upset for Wesley because he was too timid and anxious to confess his feelings for Fred, and he waited too long. He might be much more tough when it comes to women and demon fighting, but he falls in love with Fred, and he's never experienced that before. He quite literally has always shit the bed when it comes to first experiences, and it's no different here. There is still an essence of that old wimpy Wesley underneath it all, but for how much longer? Angel's a bit pissed about Gru showing up again, but assures Lon that he's better off as a solo act anyway in a relationship scenario. I mean, his track record sure as hell hasn't been stellar. Cordelia and Gru are about to get down to business when a vision hits Cordy about a demon that will rise the following day. Princess? Cordy's visions take a radically different approach now, and this scene always makes me laugh. She travels to the hotel the next day to tell the team, and they split up with Angel and Gru taking the sewers. They track it, but it escapes out into the sunlight when Angel can't go. Gru takes it out single-handedly and gets all the praise, making Angel start to question his place as a champion. As stupid as that sounds, Cordelia and Gru could make a good team like Cordy and Angel. He's just as good of a warrior when it comes to slaying things, and theoretically the team could work with Gru in Angel's place. That would be absurd, but I can see why Angel feels so self-conscious about this. Not just as a romantic partner to Cordelia, but as a warrior. That would be ideal, except Cordelia and Gru can't have sex because Cordelia is still worried about the visions transferring over to Gru like they were foretold to do in Pylea. A woman approaches the team and believes her husband is cheating on her with another woman under a love spell of some sorts. Fred and Gunn are sent to spy on the guy, but the two can't keep their eyes off of each other and lose him when he gets sucked into the roots of a nearby tree. And here we are, the most ridiculous monster of the week this season has to offer. A tree that pretends to be women on dating sites to suck the life out of men to feed itself. Angel and Wesley are off visiting a local bookstore to find a reference book containing some further prophecies and potential portions related to the Niazian scrolls. Angel begins to open up to Wesley about being inferior to Gru, but Wesley is quick to reassure him. You're like one of these rare volumes. One of a kind. I got three of them. They return to the hotel to find that Cordy has given Gru a makeover, a very angel makeover, including his clothes. He's wearing my clothes. What? Oh, yeah, I, I didn't think you'd mind. <laughs> Turns out you guys are about the same size. I think he's a little taller. Cordelia has sourced a potion that will allow her to have sex with Gru without losing her visions, and she sends Angel to go with Gru to collect a, a local demon brothel. They do so, and while they're there, Angel gets a call from the trap gun and Fred, and both him and Gru head to the tree to rescue the two. Gru begins to get his life sucked, but Angel is quick to trick the tree into taking him instead, since he's stronger. Angel isn't alive, though, and the tree dies from the dark gaping hole of death within him. Back at the hotel, Wesley has a confrontation with Gunn about keeping Fred safe, and it's no secret to Gunn that Wesley still very much has a thing for her, but Gunn tells Wesley that he won't let anything happen to her. Angel gives Cordelia some money he saved up and tells her and Gru to take a vacation somewhere for a few weeks, most likely to stop having it rubbed in his face about her new romance, but he doesn't tell her that of course. In the closing scene of the episode, Wesley translates a key portion of the prophecy, revealing a rather grim prophecy that Angel will kill Connor. Poor Wes can't catch a break, not only does Gunn swoop in on his crush, but now this weight of the infamous prophecy, ready to rip apart the only love Angel has in his life right now, the love he has for his son. This is where I would like to officially name where the Dark Wesley arc begins. If you remember last season, Angel went through a Dark Angel arc before he had his epiphany. Well, Wesley's about to have an arc that will change his character forever, and it's one of my favourites that the show ever does. Angel is feeling like crap since the Gruselog showed up again, which is the reason why he sends Cordelia on a vacation with the guy, so that he can move on with the space to breathe in. Cordelia will now not appear for a few episodes, so to be honest with you, I couldn't really find anything that tells me why Cordelia was sent away to not be in the next few episodes. There was nothing to do with Charisma Carpenter wanted to do a film like with Oz in season 4 of Buffy, so I'm... I don't know. Fred and Gunn have begun their relationship, spending some time together on a date at a diner as well as on the job. They are really lovey-dovey at this point in the relationship, but they get better. The monster of the week is terrible, but memorable, and that's one thing that a lot of this season has going for it. There are a few episodes in season 1 and 2 that I do like, don't get me wrong, but I forget about them until they pop up again on a rewatch and make me go, oh yeah, that was a thing. When it comes to this season, I remember all these episodes as they all have really memorable characters and plot lines, as well as developing character arcs at the time.
We open to Wesley having a very strange dream about Angel killing Connor as well as having blood on his hands from the prophecy. I'm sure all of that isn't subtle foreshadowing at all. Once Wes wakes up, he accompanies Angel to the doctor's office for Connor to have a checkup. Once they're done, however, a woman walks in and swaps the blood they took from Connor with a different file. Back at the hotel, a woman named Aubrey comes to the team for help, claiming her son was turned into a vampire while out of the pier that he soon went up in flames due to the sunlight. She's actually working with Holtz and Justine, who have built quite the sizable crew since we last saw them. They have the skinny on all of the team members in order to get to Angel and kill him. This isn't good enough for Sajan, however, who appears before them and is suddenly now non-corporeal. Wait, what about the cigarette? Or when he knocked on the door? Well, it's all retconned to give Sajan a reason not to go after Angel himself, because he's immaterial. Very lazy writing there, but I'll let that go. He isn't happy at how long it's taken Holtz to kill Angel, so not everything is new, and when Sajan uses Holtz's family against him to hurry up his efforts, Holtz reveals he's in possession of a mystical urn which can trap Sajan if he attempts to interfere with Holtz's plan. Sajan approaches Lila and the two agree to work together for a plan we don't know much about, although it does involve Connor's blood. Fred attempts to encourage an anxious Wesley to ask out Aubrey, hoping it will help him get over his love for her, but Wesley has a few choice words about her relationship with Gunn, and this results in Fred questioning just how appropriate her relationship with Gunn is, which she expresses to him while searching for the vampire nest on the pier. Gunn manages to put her worries to rest when they discover the location of the vamp nest, but they discover that, shock horror, there are actually vampires inside, and Gunn instructs Fred to run as he takes them on alone. But Fred stays and helps anyway. Unbeknownst to them, however, However, Justine is watching, catching the whole thing on video to study how they work together. Listen, Holtz, Spike got there a long time before you, and it didn't help him anymore. Wesley spends his time desperately trying to disprove the prophecy instead of telling anyone about it, visiting the Loa, the location of which is in this hamburger statue, in a weirdly hilarious scene that confirms Wesley's fears that the prophecy is true and will come to pass, as it is written. Simple mortal, your pain is just beginning. Betrayal and agony lie in wait, and time is running out. Angel will kill Connor, and the three signs beforehand will be an earthquake, fire, and then blood. Wesley returns forlorn to the hotel where Aubrey is and attempts to thank Wes for the team doing a good job, initiating a romance between them. Wesley calls her out as being with Holtz, and she fumbles during the conversation and discusses things about monsters that they never talked about when she was there. Angel tosses her out on her ass, and all looks pleasant until... <laughs> The foretold first sign of the prophecy coming true, an earthquake. Wes follows Aubrey back to Holt's hideout and explains that Angel and Angelus are two different people, no longer the cruel killer, but instead a hero. This obviously doesn't work, but Holt's plays into Wesley's fear of what Angel may do to his son. Now, there is no way that Holt knows about the prophecy, so he simply guesses that Wesley thinks Angel will harm Connor, and Wesley soon departs with a lot to think about. He returns to the hotel where Angel is with Connor, and the two chat about Aubrey and Connor, and Wesley soon realises that Angel's love for his son is so great that there's no way this prophecy can be true, laughing off the worry he's had for the past day or so. Suddenly another earthquake, followed by the explosion of the stove leading to fire. Once they all escape the room, a cut on Angel's head drips onto Connor. Thought we were going to be trapped in there. Well, at least I would have had something to snack on. The next day, Wesley begins stressing about what his next move should be to ensure that Angel won't kill Connor. Instead of simply telling him, he proposes taking Connor to the park at some point in the next few days. Lauren is seeing a musician client who's been possessed by a demon, and an out-of-character Angel suggests finding and killing the demons responsible, while Fred heals her. They do so, and Angel begins to act crazy, ripping apart the demons to shreds. The team go back to the hotel, and Angel begins to actively scream at Connor when he won't stop crying, which the team is very taken aback by. They soon discover that it's Angel's blood. Not his actual blood, but the blood he drinks. It's been substituted for human blood, Connor's at that, as Angel reveals that Connor has been smelling remarkably like food the past couple days. It doesn't take them long to conclude that Wolfman Hart has something to do with it, but where's Wesley during all of this? He's once again talking with Holtz, who tells Wes he has no intention of letting Connor get hurt, since he's simply an innocent child. He intends to act on Angel in a day's time, and warns Wesley of how much time he has to come up with a plan to get Connor out of the hotel for his attack. On his walk back to the hotel, Justine follows Wes and attempts to convince him that she wishes to act alone, no longer under Holtz's control. Wesley walks away, but Holtz is actually there with Justine, planning a double cross on a double cross. Angel finds Lila at a bar, and as the two talk, Sajan appears, and Angel doesn't recognise him. Yet, yeah, Sajan has had this big thing for killing Angel, and he doesn't even know him. There's something else at play here, certainly. Wesley arrives at the hotel and prepares to take Connor away for good, out of harm's way from Holt's attack, believing it to be the right thing to do given the circumstances. Lauren is still there, though, and as he makes up a story about taking Connor to the park, he hums a lullaby to him, leading into one of my favourite scenes in the whole show. I remember actively sitting up on my first watch and audibly exclaiming, 
holy shit when this happened. Everything about their expressions, you know, Wesley's desperate face, he's trying to stop Lauren from getting to the phone, gently putting Connor down as fast as he can, oh, everything. It's superbly acted by both Alexis Denisov and Andy Hallett, without any words being spoken. Wes passes Gunn and Fred on his way out, hurriedly leaving with the same story he told Lauren. Holtz arrives early to the hotel shortly after Wesley leaves, and the battle commences. Holtz doesn't actually fight anyone, though, and slips out during the fight. Afterwards, Lauren awakens and tells the team about Wesley's betrayal, although they're a bit shocked to believe him completely. Angel knew something was up when Holtz left early, now believing his attack to act more as a distraction for whatever Wesley was planning to do. Sure enough, as Wesley prepares to take Connor away somewhere, Justine shows up, seemingly hurt, claiming that Holtz did it to her and that he was everything Wesley claimed he was. Wesley, being the compassionate man he is, attempts to help her to his car until she suddenly springs to life, slitting his throat and taking Connor. As Wesley bleeds out, he reaches out in vain, watching Justine run off. Wolfram and Hart are also on the lookout for Holtz and find his command centre, but no Holtz. They hear via radio that he's been spotted near a local bridge and as they prepare to move out, Angel shows up and steals one of their jeeps. Justine takes Connor to Holtz and they prepare to move to Utah, raising Connor as their own son, as Stephen. Angel catches up with Holtz and runs him off the road on their drive to Utah, and Wolfman and Hart aren't far behind. Holtz threatens to stab Connor's neck if anyone attempts to shoot or take the baby, but then Sajan appears, Jesus Christ, and almost a portal to Kortov, a fucking hell dimension, threatening to swallow them up if Connor isn't killed. Angel realises that the only way Connor can live is if Holtz takes him away, so he gives in and tells him to leave. Sajan doesn't like this idea and begins the chat needed to swallow the entire world into Kortoth, and as Lila commands the squad to take Connor out, Holtz jumps into the portal to Kortoth, which Sajan then considers Connor as good as dead and is satisfied. Everyone else leaves, satisfied with the outcome, bar Justine I guess, as Angel wallows in grief. His son is gone, to die in a hell dimension. I have mixed feelings about these episodes. This was the set of episodes aired before a small production break was taken to film the final stretch of episodes, and it works for what it aims to do. It builds tension. Has you on the edge of your seat, throwing your feelings towards certain characters into question, all things a great show should do to leave on a brief cliffhanger in anticipation for what's to come for the rest of the season. Now we'll start with the positives first. I love the Wesley arc. We're not at the end of it just yet, but the main problem people have with it is why he doesn't tell Angel about the prophecy. Even when I watched this entire series with my mother, she even asked why Wesley doesn't tell Angel about the prophecy. And I believe that I may have finally come up with an answer, and one that will satisfy all the questions people may have regarding this. Firstly, Wesley has always had a strained relationship with his own father. This was established back in season 1, and has been teased several times over the course of his tenure on the show. He never experienced that true love a father has for his son, and is quick to jump to conclusions about how Angel will turn on his own son. He doesn't even stick around long enough to learn about Wolfram and Hart spiking Angel's blood or anything. He never learns about this. Okay, that's all well and good I hear you say, but what about the other members of the team? Why doesn't he tell them? According to the writing team themselves in a DVD featurette, Angel would have never believed such a ridiculous prophecy, Cordelia was on vacation, and Gunn and Fred's new relationship made talking to them uncomfortable for West. And Lauren, I love you, but what are you going to do about this that doesn't involve letting it slip to the other members? Plus, Wes and Lauren haven't ever been the closest of people. I mean, sure they get on, but have these two ever had a scene together? Like, just the two of them? Because I sure as hell can't think of one. He colluded with Holtz because he knows that all he wants is Angel dead, and Wes also knows that Holtz sure as hell won't succeed in that task. So he backstabs the team, believing an innocent child's life to be the most important thing here, and he acts irrationally, jumping to conclusions, persuaded and coerced to by Holtz and Justine, playing on Wesley's good side, resulting in Wesley being left for dead in the middle of a nearby park. Lila and Sajan are obviously behind the whole ploy to put Wesley on edge, inducing the needed spells to swap Angel's blood supply with Connor's blood, as well as the earthquakes. Sajan is a time-travelling demon, so he probably took care of any specifics and... Wait, Sajan is a time-travelling demon? He can travel to any point in time at will. Oh. Oh no. Sajan could have just travelled back to before Angel was a vampire and found a way to kill him there, when it was easier. He couldn't do it himself as he's non-corporeal, which was clearly only implemented here because the writers realised their fuck up with making him capable of time travel. Seriously, time travel has never worked correctly as a plot device in media where it isn't the main focus. The writers are busy with the current time. What's going on over the course of the season? And now they're implementing time travel? Oh Jesus Christ. I know it would be harder to kill Angel without a sworn rival like Holtz, but Jesus just come to him earlier through time travel. He knows where Angel will be at all times, giving Holtz the information needed to kill him when and where, taking him by surprise when he's asleep. Why not get Spike to do it? But he never got on with Angel in the beginning and tricking him into perhaps a small fortune to dust Angelus when his back is turned to be easy as all fuck. By jingo, this is why time travel is never a good plot device. Listen up all you aspiring screenwriters and filmmakers, don't fucking touch this subject in a serious manner at all because it is fragile as a glass table. Sajan opens a portal to Kortoth, threatening to swallow them all if Connor isn't killed. 
But why not just do that whenever? See what I mean? Why time travel? And with no repercussions, Sajan can just do that at any point he wishes. That's really my big gripe with any of this. The whole season past episode 7, none of this should happen. Sajan should have killed Angel centuries ago. We still don't even know why. They don't know each other. And you know what's Connor dead instead of Angel? When did that happen? There's a very good reason for it, which the show will reveal soon. Which then begs even more questions why Sajan didn't send Connor to a hell dimension when Angel wasn't around. Just throw in a line that gives Sajan some repercussions or messing with time to avoid a plot hole like this. Oh fuck it, it doesn't matter that much, but time travel. You can just tell Whedon wasn't involved with this. A green walk pitch this had to be. He wrote the fucking episode. So to sum up after that breakdown, there are portions of this arc I love. Wesley's downfall is superb, but Sajan and just everything they retcon and everything about him doesn't work. It doesn't. It's grade school level rating, seriously. I'll, tr I'll try never to talk about it again, and I will choose to ignore it for the rest of the show, playing into their little games, so I just thought I'd let this rant go on here and never again. That I will solemnly swear. This episode serves as the aftermath, as it were, to the previous double feature where Angel is determined to find a way to travel to Kortoth, Fred and Gunn attempt to find out what really happened with Wesley, as they don't believe he would betray them without good reason, and Wesley himself somehow managing to survive coming close to death as a human being could possibly get for a second time. Angel wants Sajan, who he now knows is behind everything, and the team gets to researching. Lauren finds out that not only is Kortoth like the most dangerous hell dimension there is, but that you can open a portal there. Instead, what Sajan had effectively done is tear a hole in reality in order to open a passage to Kortoth. Not only that, but but it's an entire dimension and that Kortoth is huge. Finding Connor will be like trying to locate... Oh, what was it again? Finding Connor would be like looking for a needle in a haystack. The size of China. Oh, that's right. It doesn't stop Angel who kidnaps Linwood and threatens him until he gives up the resources to make Sajan corporeal, most likely so Angel can torture him as well as bring Sajan to them. This works and Linwood tells Lila to take Angel to the White Room, an unknown floor of the Wolfram and Art building that seems to lead to a completely white room containing a girl. This little girl seems to know everything there is about Angel in a situation, seemingly some form of the senior partners, perhaps. She tells Angel who Sajan was, a granite demon, or a race that simply craved death and destruction until the senior partners made them non-corporeal, to avoid any unfortunate chaos from their actions. They could be trapped by a mystical urn, which Holtz mentioned a few episodes back, and aside from that, they are incapable of interfering with reality themselves, instead forced to watch. The girl offers to make Sajan corporeal again if he kills Lila. Without hesitation, Angel moves to do it, but the girl stops him, and with the determination to do so, never clouding his judgement for a second, is enough for her. She hands him the ritual to make Sajan corporeal, and Angel performs it in the middle of the hotel lobby. With a little help from Lila's blood, Sajan begins to form in the lobby, but then doesn't. The spell goes wrong, and Sajan is transported into the middle of a busy street, now corporeal. Meanwhile, Gunn and Fred run around trying to follow Wesley's trail to find out what's happened to make him betray them and where he is now. They come so fleetingly close to finding him at the start of their search but instead go to Holt's old hideout finding a grieving Justine who surprisingly can't be bothered to kill them. They go back to Wesley's place and find his old journals in his building's dumpster. Here they discover the prophecy and rush to inform Angel who can't care less. As he leaves to find Sajan he's attacked by Justine's troops but shrugs him off easily with Justine fleeing in Wesley's car. Hmm, say Fred and Gunn and follow her back to Sajan's lair where Justine opens up about Holt's using her to get revenge on Angel, taking his child away from him, similar to what Angel did to his own children. She also mentioned slitting Wesley's throat and that handing Connor to her wasn't on his own volition. Suddenly Sajan, who begins attacking Justine, Fred and Gunn. Suddenly Angel, who followed Sajan's blood trail after the crash to his current location. He demands that Sajan take him to Kortoth to get his son back, but Sajan explains that he only has the power to do it once before swallowing the entire universe. He also drops this major bombshell that the prophecy, the father will kill his son, was created by him. This is because the original prophecy, and the reason why he was gunning for Angel and his son, wrote that the son of a vampire with a soul will one day grow and kill Sajan. He aimed to wipe Angel or Darla out before Connor was born, or kill Connor himself to stop his own demise. It wasn't until Holtz didn't kill Angel in the alleyway that Sajan began planting false prophecies in earlier times to lead Wesley down the wrong path. All while non-corporeal, I might add, since the show doesn't. Angel and Sajan begin another brawl, and right as it looks like Sajan might get the better of Angel, he's trapped in the magical urn by Justine. Turns out Holtz wasn't bluffing. Justine tells the team where she left Wesley, but Angel has to return to the hotel due to the sunrise before they can find him. Fred and Gunn eventually find Wesley at the hospital and call Angel to give him a visit. He does, and at first, Angel tells him that he understands now why Wesley took Connor away, and he would never have hurt his own son. When Wesley lets his guard down, unable to speak or move, Angel attempts to kill him. Fuck my son! Angel, stop! Get her! Angel! I'll kill you! Come on, man, stop! You're dead! You're dead, man! Right! You're dead! I'll kill you! 
I love this episode, I do. Although the grapes with Sajan aren't solved at all, which I said I wasn't going to complain about again and I'm still keeping that promise, the episode is the right mix of both aftermath and climax. We're still in the thick of it. Angel wants to get Connor back, Wesley battles for his life while getting robbed by homeless men, and Fred and Gunn rush to find Wesley. But Wesley didn't see any reason to stay at Angel Investigations. After Fred started her relationship with Gunn, he couldn't stand the sight of either of them. Following this episode, Wesley is no longer part of the team and Angel resumes his place as leader for the first time in nearly a season and a half. But seriously though, how does Wesley not bleed out? The net contains like a million veins, right? Or something? Surely having all those sliced does some form of damage to make you die eventually. You're saying that Wesley held on through all of that, keeping pressure on his wound? He should have bled out last season, but oh, here we are. That final scene though, what an ending. I always feel a sense of dread and excitement whenever the scene creeps up. I love watching reaction videos on YouTube just for this episode, to watch people's shocked expressions that the team doesn't just go back to normal following this. Angel doesn't forgive Wesley for what he did, even though he understands. It was his son, and he doubted Angel as a father due to his own bad relationship with his father. The White Room makes its first appearance and its only appearance this season. It's more of a bigger thing in the next two seasons, but it's nice to see them actually set something up for the next season again, similar to the final stretch of episodes in season two. The little girl, the tie with the senior partners, all of this stuff will be explored more heavily then too, but this effectively is the channel that the senior partners talk through. Sajan makes his exit, although one day in the distant, distant future we will see him again, trapped in the magical urn by Justine. It's a fine exit for his character. Personally, I think the writers knew how much they fucked up this villain and how he would function in the story, so they wrote him out as soon as they possibly could to avoid any further complications with the season's story. It has good moments though, and gets us back into the swing of things, just in time for one of the worst episodes of the show. Yeah, this episode sucks, but I still kind of like it. Cordelia and Gru come back from their vacation, and that's a hell of an explanation to give, so why don't we just do it off screen and cut to Cordelia comforting Angel? Fred pays Wesley a visit at the hospital and brings him his personal belongings from the hotel. She tells him that Angel was wrong to try and kill him, but that he was right in blaming Wesley for Connor's kidnap, and that Wes is no longer welcome to the hotel. On her way out, she also informs Wesley that the prophecy was fake and he did it all for nothing. This leaves Wesley completely alone, and he's discharged from the hospital to return to his apartment. The rest of the episode is spent with Gunn and Fred. Gunn made a deal seven years earlier to sell his soul for a truck that the demon Jinoff wishes to obtain now. His soul, I mean, not the truck. Gunn tries to hide it from the team at first, especially Fred, and breaks up with her suddenly so that she won't miss him when he loses his soul. The team finds out the truth where Gunn is through a bumbling gruselug that was visited by one of Jinoff's thugs earlier but didn't tell anyone, and Angel makes a bet with Jinoff, double or nothing. If Angel wins, Gunn keeps his soul, but if Jinoff wins, he gets Gunn and Angel's souls. Angel then loses the bet and proceeds to chop Jinoff's head off, which makes me question why the fuck any of that even happened. As Jinoff births another head, Angel sets the rest of the casino on Jinoff for owing him money. At the end of the episode, Angel dismantles Connor's old crib, preparing to move on. I think the reason they wanted to do another Gunn-centric episode was because of how much they kind of fucked up the first one, which was a very slow and weak episode, placing that sort of limbo state the show was in at the start of the season. The problem is that this one isn't any better. The plot is stupid, the climax is a bit stupid, and the resolution is very stupid, but it's Angel. Come on, I can't hate this show. So it fucks up and comes out with a truly crap episode, which it hasn't really done since its first season? Maybe she, or expecting, something like that? The rest have all been pretty good, decent, or mediocre at worst. We do get a bit of progression with Wesley being estranged from the rest of the team, officially. This social abandonment changes his character for the remainder of the show, and I'm excited to get into this side of him. You do still feel for him though, I mean, we all make mistakes, maybe not quite as catastrophic as his, but still, he lost all his friends simply because he didn't stop and think for a second. He becomes more reserved and cold compared to the bumbling fool we once knew, as well as the competent demon slayer we began to get in the past season or so. Angel begins moving on from Connor, coming to terms through Cordy's help, that getting him back is impossible and will most likely never happen. <laughs> to be honest though, I find myself liking this episode more than that old gang of mine simply because it does more for the story than that episode. That episode ended with a fallout between Wesley and Gunn that seems to be forgotten about following it, as well as retreading the same gun moves on from his old crew plot we've got like a million times now. It's good to have Cordelia back though, they show Mr. Cool Head throughout the whole Wesley debacle. There are parallels to draw with Gun keeping a secret from the group similar to Wesley but on a much smaller scale. I have doubts this was intentional so I'll only briefly mention it here. A disappointing effort from David Goodman who we never hear from in the show again following this episode sadly. What a sad way to go out. David Fury, wow, wasn't expecting that. He's written a few episodes of the show before, but I wasn't expecting an episode from him this season, considering how late we are. He would be heavily involved with the final two seasons of Angel, as well as the final two seasons of Buffy, so I think he was easing himself back into Angel with this one, and the price is not a bad episode, all things considered. That ritual that Angel did two episodes ago actually opened a small tear into Kortoth, although don't ask me how, because that wasn't the ritual he performed. These weird slug creatures start to come through, possessing a potential customer, which makes him incredibly thirsty. And if he stops drinking... 
Oh, the slug escapes from the now dead guy and the team split up to hunt it down and kill it while it's in the hotel, except there's more of them and one of them manages to possess Fred. The team pretty much panics as they have no clue how to get it out of her considering she was doing all the research. It tells Angel that it's escaping Kortov due to something called the Destroyer which is trying to hunt it down and kill it. Gun goes to Wesley who can actually talk now with a bit of difficulty and he only agrees to help since Fred is involved but that none of them should come to him for help again after this. Wes, I don't have time. I wanted to live, to see my friends again to explain to the people I loved and trusted my side of what happened. The secret is alcohol, and when Gunn has her drink some vodka, it causes the slug to jump out of her and Gru kills it. Angel and Cordelia get trapped in the kitchen, and Cordy becomes some sort of big ball of light which kills all of the slugs. This is her demon powers. You know, that was established eight episodes ago and never really brought up again until now. In the lobby afterwards, the team take a break after their action-packed evening, until the tear begins to fizzle again, and this huge fucking thing bursts through. Ah yes, the destroyer. Uh, wait a minute. <laughs> Hi, Dad. Oh, shit. Oh, I love that cliffhanger so much. The entire episode isn't bad, like I mentioned before. The only thing I didn't mention in the summary was Wolfram and Hart, who serve as the, the biggest afterthought I've ever seen in my life. Seriously, it makes me think, what was the point of bringing them back for this season? Lila is working on making Angel dark again, like last season, and plans to send in a special ops team to rescue Angel from the hotel so that he doesn't die. I don't understand why she thinks Angel's going to die from this. He's faced worse. Linwood contacts Gavin and he pretty much tells Lila to let Angel die after what he did to him in Forgiving. That's it, there's nothing here. They've brought Wolfram and Hart in this season to act as shadow villains, when they were much better last season as the main villains alongside Darla. Gavin's been a pretty crap replacement for Lindsay due to the fact that we've hardly seen much of him. He gets a few scenes here and he's a funny character with good lines and delivery. I just wish they did more with him given how much they were hyping him up last season and at the start of this season. We see Wes again and he's looking much more rougher in the edges. The rest of the team avoid Wesley simply because Angel doesn't want to speak to him. Gunn and Fred strive to get Angel to forgive Wesley, but after he says no, they just decide to follow Angel like sheep. Pay Wes a visit, have dinner with the guy. Jeez. Gru becomes a temporary part of the team for the remainder of the season, and he fits in pretty well, I'd say. He has good banter with the rest of the team, however, he begins to have doubts that Cordelia actually loves him. He notices her affections for Angel and that they seem to take priority over his. Let's just forget that Angel's son literally got stolen like a week ago in the continuity of the show, and he's fucking just come back from a hell dimension now a teenager. Yep, this is Connor, as we've all known for the rest of his time on the show. I always thought it was pretty smart how they did this arc to bring in Connor as the sort of Dawn character to compare it to Buffy again. He's the destroyer and seems to have most of the demons in court off as his bitch. Cordelia shows off her demon powers for the first time and they'll never really explain what this white light is and how she activates it, but we'll talk about it again later. Fred is supposed to take over for the Wesley role of the team doing the research and all but she ends up coming across as a damsel in distress by the end. And despite not being a part of the team, Wes still saves the day and the girl. Good episode. Now let's properly introduce that new character. We open with a fantastic long shot of Connor's attempted assassination of Angel in the hotel lobby. He takes on the other team members with unbelievable power, but Angel gets the better of him. Connor flees on the top of a bus out into this unknown world. Angel heads out through the sewers to catch up with the particular bus and its destination as the other team members get to work on closing the tear to Kortoth. Lauren heads to get help from the mistress Myrna, but before he can get back, Cordy and Gru are sent flying by something else coming through the tear, which knocks them unconscious. Myrna closes the tear and leaves once her services are no longer needed. Connor goes exploring in Los Angeles befriending a junkie named Sunny, who he saves from a psychotic drug dealer named Tyke, taking his ear as a trophy. Sunny introduces Connor to this world's food and clothes as well as romance. Oh, I'm sure that's the most hygienic kiss that the world has ever experienced. A junkie and a teenager who's lived his whole life in a dimension without toothpaste yet still has remarkably white teeth. Mm. Sunny ends up overdosing in the bathroom while Connor sleeps when Angel eventually tracks him down and attempts to calm him down. Connor still goes by Steven and has been training his whole life to one day kill Angel, as his father Holtz has taught him to do. Tyke suddenly bursts in, one year of the gang of other drug dealers, followed shortly by the police, and a shootout begins. Tyke and his gang are killed while Angel and Connor manage to escape, Angel taking a shotgun blast to the torso like a champ, making out the window safely. Out the window again, like father like son. The two recover on the nearby street and Angel offers Connor to come stay at the hotel. Connor declines and runs off, finding a much older Holtz in an alleyway. Holtz is back, and he's what came through the tear that knocked Cordelia and grew unconscious. The majority of the episode, though, is spent with Connor and his adventure with Sonny and Tyke. It reminds me a bit of the first episode of the show, where Angel doesn't save the girl who needs his help due to her own weaknesses. Connor rescues Sonny, but can't stop her from overdoing 
overdosing on drugs and she dies too. And Connor is here and there's a sense of infamy surrounding his character. It's no secret to any Angel viewer that Connor is universally viewed as the most unlikable main character that either Buffy or show has ever come up with. And you thought Dawn was bad? You ain't seen nothing yet. Be prepared for more whining, yelling and stroppiness and a tantrum throwing toddler. They murder his character next season but for the most part he's fine here. It's understandable that Killing Angel would be on his radar considering his entire life's meaning has been to train to kill by Holtz, who hasn't kept any secrets from Connor about Angel being his real father or that he's a vampire. For the purposes of Connor's time on the show, I will be using this clip from a gag reel where his actor Vincent Carthizer gets absolutely decimated by David Boreanaz running into a door. <laughs> It helps me keep cool and I feel like justice is being served to the character because it sure as hell isn't going to happen in the show itself. And the only other plot in this episode is a brief scene between Wesley and Lila, who shows up to offer Wes a job at Wolfman Hart in an attempt to maybe turn him on his old friends as someone who once ran the place. He declines, although he does think about it again later. It would have been cool to see Wesley be a villain for a little while, but the direction they go with his character anyway is good enough that I don't really sleep over the decision not to. I guess Buffy was doing something similar at the exact same time with Willow, which we now know is due to Alison Hannigan not exactly being the nicest person on the planet Earth. More on that in the season 6 video. There are some flirtations thrown into the mix between the two, a lot of sexual tension that wasn't there before. Overall, a solid introduction for the complex and controversial Connor. Holtz gives Connor the task of infiltrating Angel investigations to learn more about them, but that his task was never to kill Angel, believe it or not. Holtz doesn't want Angel dead anymore, but to go back to Angel and be on his guard while learning more about this new world. Holtz seems content with his life now. Yeah, he's raised a child, got back at Angel, who's already struggling to redeem for his previous evil deeds, and lived a full life, even if it was in a hell dimension. Connor, sure enough, does return to the hotel, and Angel welcomes him to what he wants to be Connor's new home. Cordelia has a vision about a nightclub, and Angel takes Connor along for the ride to take out some vampires. Wesley sits alone in his home, receiving an anonymous message to meet at the nightclub where Lila greets him, showing that Justine, the woman who slit Wesley's throat, is in the danger zone of vampires and to enjoy the show of her death. Wesley doesn't want to watch Justine die, he gets no pleasure out of it, although when Lila asks if he's going to warn her, Wesley hesitates, which tells Lila all she needs to know. He spots Angel though alongside Connor, who Wesley doesn't seem to be too surprised to see, all things considered. Angel and Connor work together to take out the vampires as Holtz watches them play fight in the alley. Connor returns to the motel and tells Holtz that Angel still hasn't won him over yet and he still believes him to be a monster deep down. Holtz wants Connor to go back to Angel and that he will help Connor find out what he truly is since it's obvious from his fighting abilities that there's more in him than just human. Cordelia tells Angel that she went back into her vision after he left and saw the whole fight. And the thing is, they both act like this ability is new, brung on by her demon powers, but what about Dead End? When Angel had to convince Cordy to go back into her vision to get them a new lead, are we just going to pretend that never happened? I'm pretty sure I mentioned how weird that ability was to never have been talked about before in the Angel Season 2 video. Connor comes back to the hotel and begins threatening Lauren since he's a demon. Cordelia uses her demon powers to cleanse his soul. I, what? What can't these powers do and why are they only happening now? Connor no longer possesses the evilness that Kortoth had put in him, breaking down his emotional walls that have protected him from the truth or something. To be honest, it's not explained very well at all what this means, but I guess Connor's good now? Ha <laughs> ha, that'll be the day. Fred and Gunn find Holtz by following Connor earlier and Angel plans to confront him. Justina's first to get to Holtz, though I guess she also followed Connor since she saw him at the club. Holtz explains that raising Connor brought back love in his life. He truly cares for Connor and thrives in that more than he did the hate he had when he was last on Earth. Fred and Gunn are given the task of distracting Connor while Angel confronts Holtz, although he overhears them talking about it when he's extremely far away, demon hearing it may seem, and he runs to stop Angel from killing Holtz. Angel finds Holtz, Justine now absent, writing a letter to Connor to tell him to live with Angel. Angel apologises for killing Holtz's family since Holtz never did the same, he, you know, he kept Connor alive. Holtz plans to leave with Connor staying behind to live with the rest of his life with Angel. Angel leaves to head for the hotel as Justine returns and Holtz begs her to kill him, stabbing him in the neck twice to make it look like a vampire bite. Connor arrives shortly after and believes that Angel killed him, ending the episode. So Holtz is dead. Despite him claiming all this peace and love stuff, he actually has Justine frame Angel for his murder. I'm not surprised that Holtz is still gunning for Angel even though he tries to come across as his new man when he talks with both Connor and Angel. He knows that this will force Connor to kill Angel, exactly as planned, even though he does actually love Connor like his own son. I can't really fault Connor for his upcoming actions and the conclusion he comes to when discovering Holtz's body. He's been raised his whole life to believe Angel to be the most evil being there is and naturally assumes he's to blame. Side note, what kind of relationship are Justine and Holtz meant to have? They show them to be friends or partners in crime, I'm not sure, but it always seemed to me that Justine had romantic feelings towards Holtz since she really doesn't want to kill him at the end of the episode even though it will complete the plan they've worked towards for so long. A big focus on the team's portion of the episode is Gru and Cordelia. Gru is feeling similar in a lot of ways to Riley from Buffy. He loves Cordelia but knows that Cordelia doesn't love him back. Angel is who she really cares for and loves, not him. He shares a touching conversation with Lauren about this and you really have to feel for Gru here. And I don't know 
if this was just the Angel writers' way of bragging that they could do Riley's exit plot better than the Buffy writers, because if so, that's exactly what they did. Gru remains likeable for me throughout this arc, and he deals with it a lot better than Riley did, that's for sure. Connor has demon powers and overhears Fred and Gun in this episode, leading to the final scene. Cory cleans his soul, but in the end, this means absolutely bog all as he still wants to kill Angel at the end of the episode because of Holt's death. Wes and Lila continue to talk as well as flirt, mostly on Lila's side, and all of these arcs will come to a satisfying conclusion in the next episode, the season finale, right? Right? This episode as a season finale is very disappointing. I'm just gonna get that right out of the way now. I would have coupled this with the previous episode as a two-part story, but the structure is presented standalone. As much as you would expect Connor to just begin attacking Angel, continuing the high pace of the previous episode, he just joins back with him and pretends to get on playing along with their games. They go out to the movies where Wolfram and Hart attempt to attack and kidnap Connor, but Angel and also Connor threaten Linwood to leave them and never come back. Oh good, another Linwood threatening scene. Meanwhile, oh my giddy aunt. Yes, Wesley and Lila get it on and begin a sexual relationship. Lauren plans on leaving to head to Las Vegas to sing for a friend who owns a club there. Before he leaves however he tells Angel that Cordelia loves him and that they should be together. At the same time Gru plans to leave Cordelia who also tells her that she loves Angel and that they're meant to be together. Gru leaves and Cordelia calls Angel to plan a meetup where she wants to confess her feelings for them on a nearby cliffside. Angel relays the information of where they're meeting up while Connor is in the room and he tells Justine, presumably. Cordelia doesn't make it to the cliffside as Skip shows up again who tells her that because of both her demon powers and tied to the powers that be, she is now a higher being. She's outgrown this plane of existence and Skip encourages her to move on. Connor meets Angel at the cliffside and the two be in a tussle, falling down the cliffside, knocking Angel unconscious. Justine meets him in a random boat, that's never explained, and they nail Angel into a coffin, throwing him into the ocean, and as Cordelia ascends and Angel descends, the episode just fucking ends. What was that? That wasn't a high octane season finale, it wasn't even an epilogue because the plot kept going. There's so much going on here and all of it isn't the most entertaining or pleasant to watch. Firstly, the way Cordelia treats Gru in this final stretch of episodes is awful. She constantly forgets he's there and refers to him as a puppy dog. What a bitch! Gru leaves here and never comes back. We never see him again until the comics. What a weak exit for a strong recurring character. It makes me wonder just what the point of bringing him back was. In the function of the story, it was to prolong the romantic tension between Angel and Cordelia until the end of the season and to help Cordelia realise that she is in love with Angel. But we didn't have to. Just have the two be together. Cordy not believing Wes because she trusts Angel to not hurt Connor, yada yada yada, higher plane. I just did the whole story in about two seconds without Gru. Like I said earlier, there's more to this skip business and what exactly happens to Cordelia in this new plane will be revealed next season in a cliffhanger ending to the season. And I'm going to say this now because it'll probably come up again when I do other shows, but I hate cliffhanger endings to seasons. To keep a viewer interested from episode to episode, sure, that's great. But when your story wraps up and is effectively completed by the end of a 22 episode run which is more than enough time to do so and you still end on a cliffhanger, effectively making the first episode of season 4, season 3, episode 23? That sucks! If people enjoyed an entire season of television and committed to watching it every week, they shouldn't have to be punished for an entire summer to entice them to come back. They'd do it anyway if they enjoyed it. Buffy doesn't end on a cliffhanger in any of its seasons. They wrap up every story with leaks and hints of what's to come at the start of the next season, which is something that Angel did exceptionally well in its previous season. Season 2 ended with so many new possibilities and it finished in a way that made you want to see the next episode without it making it feel like you're being forced to keep going. Angel gets pulled through the ringer and Connor colludes with Justine whilst burying Holtz to send Angel to the bottom of the ocean as punishment for killing Holtz. Just so that Angel is forced to live down there for the rest of his existence, incapable of doing anything, almost like a prison sentence. In hell. Man, play the fucking door clip. <laughs> And don't get me wrong, this episode works for Connor's character at this point in his story, but he never recovers from this. This one act defines his character for the entirety of next season, as much as it pains me to say so. Gunn and Fred are all that's left of the team now and they've gotten more tolerable as a couple. Fred has made strides of development this season from an insane, babbling maniac to a competent, funny, smart and very literate member of the team. I can't say the same for Gunn at all. We see a softer side to him with Fred, but that doesn't change him completely. He's still Gunn at the end of the season, just like he was at the beginning. He gets two episodes this season and neither does anything for his character. He's already a part of the team. We don't need that to be reassured or challenged by his former crew. And we did that last season. It's a shame because Gunn is undoubtedly one of the funniest characters of the show and J. August Richards plays the character confidently, but there's only so many laughs you can give without doing anything else. I know I keep bringing him up, but remember Doyle? That was a character that went from flawed and back-talking to a hero who sacrifices himself to save a peaceful race of demons in only nine episodes. It never feels right 
polished and they keep the core of what makes his character throughout. People like Tim Minear and David Greenwald were still around even back then to give us that sensational arc. So what happened here? You know what you do with a character you can't do anything more with? Kill them off! I'm very anxious about how they'll cope with this in season 4 because I really want Gunn to do something new. Please don't let me down. Wesley shows that this kind of development is still possible from the writing team. He goes from confident demon hunter yet shy romancer with a heart for Fred, which ends up clouding his judgement when the prophecy estranges him from the team, causing all the human and heartless character to wipe out of existence. This is a completely different character from this, and these are 9 episodes apart. They can still do it! He begins a sexual relationship with Lila that goes on to be a fan favourite of the show, and although they never actually date, it's a cool place to explore with Wes's character. Angel follows a similar path to Wesley, falling in love, but is unable to express it effectively and in time to initiate a romance. I like the contrast of where the relationship gets the two, with Cordelia ascending into brightness and Angel descending into darkness, and despite the connotations this might give off, next season will reveal that these two should effectively be swapped. Angel ends up having the better outcome while Cordelia… oh boy, not quite yet but we'll get there. It's far from the best season finale the show has, but it's not an inherently flawed episode. I just wish it was treated more like a proper part 2 to Benediction and a proper season finale rather than its own separate story. Well, that was disappointing. My experience with this as a casual viewer was much more positive than as a critical one. I still enjoy a lot of aspects and episodes of the season, and I can honestly see why I once listed it as my favourite of the show. The development of characters like Wesley, Cordelia and Fred, as well as effective villains like Holtz and Lila, and thrilling storylines with Darla's pregnancy and Connor's return from Kortoth really give this story some strong elements. There are still drawbacks to these same praises. Gun and Angel's development isn't very fleshed out, Sajan and the rest of Wolfram and Heart suck and only serve minuscule parts of this story, you get a ridiculous amount of screen time, and the stop-start attitude the structure of the season has, especially after it takes its sweet time getting started in the first place, are all valid criticisms. Season 2 is a season I enjoyed far more after watching it with a critical eye, following its exceptionally well thought out and well written storylines. Season 3 is the opposite. I enjoyed it far less after watching it with a critical eye, following its not very well thought out and messily written storylines. For the most part, the individual episodes are very strong, the cases and villains from week to week are all very memorable even when they're stupid, and there's still a lot of my favourite episodes from the show in this season. It's that overarching story that started so strongly ends clumsily as they rush to retcon things to serve their newly developed ideas, while leaving glaring plot holes open to tear down the walls of the entire story. My favourite episode is Carpe Noctum, the writing is top notch and showcases exactly what I mean by individual episodes being stronger, but to contrast my least favourite episode is that of Gang of Mine. Doesn't do a lot for the story and is a poor example of an individual episode. It's very slow, one note and drags on a bit too long for my liking. Hell, you'd think I was talking about the next season with talk like that, and yes, I can't express how much I am shitting myself to jump into season 4. The most notorious season of either Buffy or Angel with its convoluted and complex plotlines, oh boy. If you thought this video was long as all hell, I imagine that one's gonna be even longer than this.